Hello and welcome to More Than The Song, an opportunity to discuss the voice and sung worship within the Salvation Army. At Music Editorial, we are conducting interviews with a variety of choral leaders and champions of vocal music, with the aim to receive inspiration and sound teaching, and also to re-energize those of you who have a love for singing. Today, I'm joined by Sue Blythe, and just a quick introduction about Sue, if you don't already know her. Sue studied at Cheatham School of Music and then went on to graduate from the Royal Northern College of Music with a degree in Music and Opera Studies. She's appeared as a soloist in concert halls such as the Royal Albert Hall, the Queen Elizabeth Hall, and in Canada at the Roy Thompson Hall. And Sue has been a songster leader at Sale Corps in Manchester, leader of the Central North and West Scotland Divisional Youth Choruses, and vocal instructor, instructor at the Salvation Army's UK Territorial Music School. Along with her husband, Andrew, Sue has visited various Salvation Army music schools across the world as a guest vocal leader. Currently, she is the songster leader at Peterborough Corps. As well as all of this, Sue is an esteemed and well-respected head teacher at the happiest school in the UK. As well as, um, and she also works for the Cambridge Education Authority as a school's advisor. So thank you so much, Sue, for joining us and taking time. I know it's an extremely busy time for you at the moment, um, especially with all the new guidelines coming out and whatnot. <laughs> so you're having to kind of deal with all of that, but thank you for joining. Um, so I'll start with a question that I'm asking each of our guests first up. Um, so we recognise that beyond this deep theology within singing are the years of practice and dedication that makes a performance more than a song. What makes a vocal offering more than a song to you? I think that one is quite um, an easy one for me. Um, I, I often will say to young singers that um, for me, it's about um, seeing the heart of the singer when they sing. So um, somebody might have the best vocal technique um, and they may sing perfectly in tune and all that kind of thing. But if there's nothing there, if I'm not getting anything in terms of seeing in their eyes or in their heart what's behind that, then quite frankly, I'm, I'm turned off it. So for me, it's about understanding um, the lyrics that, that I'm singing, being able to interpret that in a musical sense, but to be able to put my whole sort of passion, my belief, my understanding into that song so that others will recognise that as well. That, that, that's the important thing. So it's not just a performance, it's almost an internalisation of, 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 of what I'm singing um and, and being able to share that with the listener yeah so that, that that's what makes it more than a song being able to see the heart of the singer when when they when they bring that offering mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's good um i'd like to talk about the voice with you um so if our previous guests for this video series have approached kind of this conversation as choral leaders and educators and although you are that but you're also a singer in your own right um, and I know you're very open about issues you've had with your voice and your vocal health. And for many singers, it's something they struggle to open up about. And, and what I think we have in the Salvation Army are, are vocal health issues flying around everywhere. But actually, there's, there's no place for people to discuss it and to understand it. Kind of go to, they might go to a doctor, but a lot of the time they'll keep acting on it and keep using it. Um, taking a vocal zone and just hoping it'll go away kind of thing and in the long run damaging their voice um so why do you feel it's important to talk about uh vocal health and for singers to talk about that openly yeah i i i absolutely agree with you and i think in the army particularly if we're involved in songsters or and you know um other forms of singing we have that thing within us that we've got to keep on going and that no matter what's happening here actually or even in here um that that, that still has to happen and I, and I also think you know we're, we're afraid to admit it because it's a weakness maybe um and uh so i think it's vitally important that we we teach people about vocal health so um i would say you know i i've had two periods of poor vocal health 
Um, one when I was in my 20s. So if you think I'd just come out of that sort of um, conservatoire training. So, uh, you know, my whole, from being 13, um, my whole life had just been geared to being this professional singer. So, you know, intense singing lessons, um, learning what, what my voice sounded like and how to use my voice. And, but equally, having an, an interesting juxtaposition of this is how to sing in a classical sense and this is how you sing when you're at college and that may be going out of the window when i go to the core and start singing so as a kid um you know in the singing company and if my mother's watching this i apologize now because she was a singing company leader but it would be you know come on sing sing and so you would do everything from here because, and, and I see it now with children, you know, they, they'll sing, oh, from, everything's, everything's coming from here because you just go for volume over anything else. And, and I see that quite a lot in, in, in the army, really. So I think that was a bit of an issue for me. And it took a while for my singing teachers when I got to Cheetham's and, and, the, and the Royal Northern to, to kind of direct me in the right way to, to help me understand that, pushing the voice instead of riding on the bed of air was 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 not healthy but there are other things that take place in our lives so you know i'm thinking you know my i lost my voice the first time when i just had a baby and i think as women sometimes hormones play a massive part in in what's happening in our in our voice boxes as well and, and, it, and it really does and if you do a lot of reading about that and i have done recently that's quite a thing but it's seemingly we don't want to acknowledge that um that, that that might be the case the second time when it happened to me and and i had i've had um twice something called dysphonia which is when the vocal cords kind of refuse to to work so they slacken completely and when you try to burst them into action they really struggle they'll do it if you force your voice so if you're doing that whole ah, they'll suddenly click into place. So I, 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 I could sing loudly. If you asked me to belt something, I could do that. But sing quietly, smoothly, you know, go up to a higher register, it just wasn't working. So it, they, the, voice, the vocal cords need training again to, to learn how to, to come back together. Um, but yeah, I think as a song leader, as well as a vocal soloist, you kind of feel that thing to keep on going and everyone's looking at you to be the leader and to help them understand how to use their voice properly and I think it's okay to say you know what I forgot or or, or I, I made a mistake now you know in my in my professional life at school we're all about making mistakes it's all about children making mistakes and learning from them my teachers are free to make mistakes and I'll go you know what it's fine we'll learn from it but we, we, we tend not to do that maybe with the voice so much. And part of that is probably because the voice is such a personal thing for us. When we open our voice, open our mouths to sing, that's us that we're sharing with the world. You know, your voice is unique to you. When a cornet player stands up to play, as beautiful as that is, and as much as that's an extension of your personality, the brass sound is a brass sound. It can be a beautiful one, it can be an awful one, but um, you know, it, it, this, is, this is just personal. There's nothing in front of your face. You're just sharing who you are with everybody. So maybe I think that makes us feel a little bit vulnerable and then we shouldn't necessarily um, put our hands up and say I'm struggling. But um, you know, I've been happy to do that. In fact, when I went to the speech therapist this last time, um, <clears throat> She, she said to me, well, what's your background? So I shared with her the background, you know, the training that I've had, um, um, the singing lessons, the singing teachers I've worked with, the things that, and she said, well, what do you already know? So I told her what I already knew. And she said, so why aren't you doing it? And, and I think it really was a case of, oh yes, why have I stopped doing that, you know, and reminding myself again of, of those of those basic things that we need to do to protect the voice and to make sure that it's healthy to be able to continue. Yeah. So it's that acknowledging that sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes things happen to our voices anyway, because things are happening in our lives. And, I, and I'm a big believer in that. Um, uh, but it's OK to go help and go back to what we already know and try and learn again. Yeah, and I think 
lots of seniors who do have issues find that the best thing they can do is strip it right back and almost start again. And I had yeah, a senior exactly. who, went to, she, she was an operatic mezzo, and um, she said in her 20s after she went to the National Opera Studio and all of that, and she, she kind of graduated from that and straight away went to sing Wagner all the time. And she was getting offered all these roles for Wagner. And by the time she was 30, she said she completely, she couldn't sing anymore. She physically couldn't sing anymore. Yeah. Um, so she had to go back to the very beginning and learn again. Um, and then she was a different type of mezzo after that. But yeah, it's, it's, it can happen to even the best of the professionals where, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, <clears throat> the, the first time it happened to me, the Three Sopranos were recording. So I was part of this, the Three Sopranos group and we were in our second recording. Um, so we were we were traveling the world and you know the recordings were were popular and people you know we were we were away every weekend and a month, once a month you know like the ISSR you, you're you're working I'm working as a teacher in the meantime on, on my voice all the time that keeps going and we recorded and I remember thinking this is not right um, and, uh, and it was Len Valentine that said to me something isn't right with that voice girl <laughs> um and although the, the recording sounds fine i'm quite happy with with some of it but some of it sounds really raw speech therapist and i was really fortunate at that point that i went i went to a speech therapist to work with the opera studio so she knew how singers work fundamentally she really got me um, and was able to we were able to strip it right back and i know now that the sound i made after that is, is different you know um if i listen to subsequent recordings my voice has a different quality to it than it did, did initially now i know that comes with getting older as well but there was definitely a a, a rounder and warmer sound that came out of it um because i had to strip right back and start again and to to summarize kind of this topic what advice would you give to a a, a singer in the army who is struggling with their voice stop <laughs> stop be honest because it's only going to bring problems in the long run you're only, you know you might think oh it's okay for now you know I'll, I'll keep going on it i'll keep going i'll keep drinking the water i'll do the honey i'll drink i'll take the vocal zones i'm steaming 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 but in the end no amount of that is going to help you in the long run you you, you really do need to rest and you know what? People, people will wait. I think sometimes we worry then that we're going to lose what we, what, we, what we currently have. And I think for singers in the army, well, we do see it as a ministry. This is a ministry opportunity. I know for me, oh gosh, well, how, how will I now you know, show my faith? How will I help to, to minister to other people? There'll be other ways, and, and it, during that time, God will find other ways. He did for me, um, but those things will return, um, and, and, and people will wait. So it's okay to step back and say, no, I need to look after this for a minute, but I'll be back soon. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's good, and actually, because you're a teacher as well, and um, from, from things I've read, actually, it's so common for teachers to lose their voice because you are constantly giving presentations yeah. constantly absolutely yeah it, it, it's so common for teachers in fact i mean it's a bit of a soapbox of mine really because when when people are trained to be teachers one of the things they don't really spend much time on is is voice production mm -hmm. um and, and if you think you know when i address my school i'm addressing 500 children and the staff in a large hall without any kind of amplification so um you know you, you are having to project your voice and and i see so many teachers and you know and you just or on the playground you know the um, my first speech therapist taught me how to shout naughty boys names properly <laughs> so that i didn't so from my diaphragm so that i didn't you know spoil my voice but it is a massive thing with with with, with teachers and i think for me, that was part of the problem this time, is that it was that it's teaching and you're constantly on your voice. Yeah. Then you're constantly on your voice when you go down the hall because you're the songs leader and you're talking in practice and, and, and you're singing and you're, and you're soloing and all, all the rest of it, that this just doesn't get a rest and, and, and everything kind of merges and you forget what, mm, yeah. what you should be doing. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, we'll move on to, I want to talk about 
story and emotion and behind a song and, and, and expressing emotions through a song. And I've seen you in a rehearsal situation, for example, with, with the girls chorus at, at our territorial music school. And I think that you, you, you have a gift to draw out story from people. And if you, <laughs> it's a weird expression, you know what I mean? And, and really kind of getting, getting people to invest in what they're singing. Um, what importance uh, do you place on the story of a song in a rehearsal setting? Massive. <laughs> I mean, I said to you at the beginning that, you know, the thing about more than a song, it's got to be about what we believe. Now, as Christian singers, the greatest thing we can do is to share the message of Jesus Christ. And if that isn't within us, if we have no comprehension of where that's coming from or what that lyric is saying to me as a person, then we're going to struggle to you know inspire anybody else and so for me when i'm when i when i'm teaching a group yeah we get the notes right first but i'm also very careful then to to think about what are we actually singing about and i'll do that with the songs and and you know sometimes um i have a wonderful uh, um, pianist for our songs brigade roy kersop who actually was my first pianist when I was at, uh, when I started at Territorial Music School when I was 27. He, he was the pianist there, but now he's my core pianist and he'll quite often just fold his arms because he, he knows there's a song coming. But I tell you what, the ones where I know that I've spent a lot of time with the group, really sort of drawing out the story, if it's based on a biblical text, let's talk about that, let's unpick that, let's understand, you know, um, I have seen the glory of the Lord, a breath of, you know, breath of wind. Wow. In the silence, I hear your name. Where, where was that from? On the mountaintop? Where, where was that? And, and, and I'm picking that almost in a bit of a Bible study in, in our rehearsals. And sometimes it's just about, you know, I'll share personal stories of how I know that lyric might have impacted on me. And then other people tell me, oh, yeah, I can identify with that. So it's it's finding things that I know people will identify with so that then we can really draw out what that's about and what that song is saying. It's crucial because if I'm going to stand up and present either as a soloist or as a member of a choir, I've got to do that knowing what that what that songwriter is trying to get across and what I know in my heart to be the case and people will say that you know Peterborough Citadel songsters are not they're wonderful if they're listening they're wonderful they are not the all of them soloists they're not the greatest choir that ever walked the planet but they're wonderful and people tell me that when they sing they communicate their faith so to me, that is a blessing as their songs leader to stand in front of them and to be able to go, you know, yes, wow, I've seen the glory of the Lord or, or, or whatever it is that we're singing, because I can see it in their eyes and their faces. But that's taken a lot of work beforehand mm -hmm. to get to that point. It'd be, the, it'd be the same with the girls at, at Territorial Music School, you know, because they're newer in their faith. Um, some of them are not even at that point where they've even found their faith. Um, so for me, that's really important that we're able to share our stories and share how those lyrics might have impacted on us or a time when, oh gosh, you know, simply trusting. Yeah, I remember when that, this happened or using other people from the group who I know might identify with that lyric and asking them to share their story as well so that we can all identify with that is, for me, is hugely important. We never ever look at a song as just notes, yeah. you know, dynamics, notes, rhythms. Of course, those things are important and we have to get those right. But then we won't ever, we won't ever sing a song in a, in, in a Sunday morning meeting or in a festival that we don't know, you know, the reason why we're doing this, really. Yeah. And that's why I keep saying, you know, we're fortunate, Peter, with the, the setup is that at our core, we stand on the steps of the platform, we look out at our congregation, it's a huge hall, there's a balcony, and quite often I'll say to the songs, turn around, turn around, look, those are the people there, these are the people that need to 
hear about Jesus, what are you going to do in this song that's going to get that message to them? And that's that's a really important thing. And I, I think for me, that there's nothing more exciting, and I've probably said this before in this in this video series, nothing more exciting than when you see a choir and just their enthusiasm and their it's infectious. So I remember as a kid, I think I was about nine or ten. Uh, we went to see Pasadena to have songs yes. in the UK on tour. And I remember as a 10-year-old coming away thinking, not under, I wasn't into singing or anything at that point necessarily, but coming away and trying to work out in my head what on earth it was that has made me feel excited. And then absolutely, again, yeah. another choir from California <laughs> came, I think it was last year, the Gary Bonner Singers, and I, I walked away from their concert just excited and, and really convicted that, how knowing how effective singing can be because it's in their physicality when they're singing as a group their movements are together their facial expressions you know yeah. they tell they're just really internalizing what they're singing and i think that's yeah and you know and and, and and i would say you know um i agree with you i i would have been in my 20s and pasadena came and i remember thinking and i was the same you know wow i'm trying to pick that apart what what was that about? And what had they got that, you know, I, I wasn't sure I was, I was seeing at the time. Birmingham Citadel Songsters, I never failed to hear them and be touched. I, 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 I have a really emotional connection with what they are presenting because of the way it is done. Every one of them is giving. You know, you see it in their bodies. They're excited. They're passionate. Um, and, and, and I, I love, you know, as, as, as a core brigade in our territory, I love um, seeing, seeing and listening to them because there's a real connection there. You know that yeah. what is on their heart is coming out in, in what you're hearing. Yeah. yeah, and I think, yeah, so we're getting at this, this importance of investing as much time as you can in the story of the song in a rehearsal so that when it comes to singing it out mm -hmm. and ministering in that way, that actually it comes as second nature to the choristers and that you're, you know, they're, they're just yeah. sharing their story genuinely and authentically. Um, That's right and, another, and I was going to say another thing Carl, those, those, those songs that we have spent that sort of time on, when you bring them out again after a, after a, a while, so for example I'll, I'll use Andrew Maycock's Everywhere, mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time on that, you know, have you ever stopped? To think, have you ever stopped? To you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, we, then we don't sing it for a while. If I bring that out, if we went all back to our cores and our halls on Sunday, if I said, right, we're singing that, they will sing that as if we'd just rehearsed it last week. Because, because everything is stirred again. The emotion stirred, the memory is stirred, everything we've talked about, the way we connect with the words, so therefore the way we use our bodies when, you know, and the way, the, the way technically I, I'm telling you, remember to do this, all of that suddenly falls into place. So you almost don't need, you know, to keep, oh, we'll rehearse the piece for Sunday. Well, we don't need to because they will, they'll just click in. It, it's, it's incredible how that works. But the ones we've really spent time on, they don't need a rehearsal again. We could just sing them again. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's pretty cool. It leads us on to um, talking about choral music in the Salvation Army. Um, and you spent a lot of time working with choirs, obviously, as noticed at the beginning. Um, and I think you've got first-hand experience with working with the girls' chorus, particularly, and the youth choruses, where you're working with younger singers. Um, and these are questions I've posed to the other guests as well. Um, and it's just very interesting on an international level to see where different territories are and, and all sorts. Um, so where do you see the future of choral singing in the Salvation Army? Um, well, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think, you know, we've got um, an amazing vehicle because if you look at, um, in, in this country alone, if you look at the success of choirs, so whether, whether you're a fan or not, Gareth Malone has raised up this sort of 
this choir community based thing you know when I kind of look in even in my own school a number of my staff belong to community choirs or gospel choirs they're not Christians they don't go to church but it's something they do as part of their week because they're interested in it so you know we've got this it's, it's an amazing gift really it's a real positive thing that people want to do we've got lyrics that we can share you know people people identify with that whether that is all you need is love or whether that is have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? I don't know. Um, so, so we've got an amazing vehicle to use. So choral singing in the Salvation Army, I think, is, is vastly important. But what I worry about, and I'll be really honest, in our territory, I worry about leadership of choral music. Because I'm, I, I am not seeing a massive um, wealth of, of young people. Now, I was fortunate to um, be really looked after and mentored um, and probably spotted before I even thought that that's anything that I wanted to do. So, you know, I was a singer. That, 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 that's what that was. And then I, because I was at the core at Manchester, because I was at the Royal Northern, obviously I was in the songsters at Manchester, we moved to Sale. I became the deputy songster leader. And I, and I was really fortunate to have learned from some fabulous choral leaders who were very different in their own right. Even in my home core at Gainsborough, my uncle Alan was a songster leader. What he lacked in musicality, in terms of the, 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 the knowledge of how to sing and, and sort of what technical things were called, he more than made up for in his personality and in encouragement and in getting what he wanted from the singers. Those songsters, I watched them, they ate out of the palm of his hand. He could have said, we're all dancing hula hoops and they would have done it for him. To then move to Sale and, and to work under Frank Crowhurst, who was a musician, you know and very technically minded and to sit and watch him and to learn and and to be encouraged um, as the, as his deputy and then and then to take over the brigade um, you know when I was only in my early 20s was an, it was an incredible thing and, and that's why I, I, I'm not necessarily seeing continuing all the time and I, and I, and I hope maybe I'm wrong in that but I'd just like to see a little bit more of that um, you know, in the core myself now, you know, I haven't had a deputy for ages because it's like, oh, you know. <laughs> and now do, and he's younger than me, and that's fabulous, you know, Phil is, um, is, is, is great, he's, he's always been a band trainer, now he's learning how to do vocal stuff, but to be able to sort of mentor and work alongside, and then Carl, as yourself, and don't cut this bit out of the video, um, but you know, Carl and I, we were going to work together this year at Territorial Music School, and that's been something that I've always been saying please 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 you know bring Carl in because we need to be growing you guys as, as choral leaders but you know I see that in seeing companies let's get these these older young people um, trained up in the singing company Let, let's work with them let songs leaders work with our singing company leaders our assistant singing company leaders let let them have a chance you know i mean my own daughter my abigail is, is our assistant singing company leader and and just in the last couple of years yes she sings beautifully but does she know how to get the best out of a group and just to watch her grow as she has grown in her conducting in the way that she is with the children that that that's been amazing to watch over two years how she's developed in confidence and in core we really need to be looking out for those young people and be saying how can we how can we progress these these people and be talking to them about things like vocal health um, and technique um, and preparing music for rehearsal and how to teach the children that or how to teach adults that um, when I became the leader at Territorial Music School um, I remember sitting down one day opposite Peter Ayling at lunch as a student at the Territorial Music School and Susan Turner who had said that she was going to retire that year and obviously we were all talking about who would replace Sue. Um, we'd, we'd, we'd worked under Sue and Len for years and years and again I'd learned so much from them both, the different styles and techniques. It was a masterclass to sit in their rehearsals. Um, and I remember saying to Peter Ayling, right, well, who are you going to get next? And he said, how about you? <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? I 
I'm not that, you know. But again, I was fortunate to be paired up with, you know, people like Richard Phillips, Derek Kane, Andrew Blythe, um, who, who I was able to work alongside and, and learn from and develop with and grow with. Um, and we need to make sure we're, we're, we're having those opportunities. And can I also say maybe some of us didn't ought to be in our positions for a very, 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 very long time. Is that controversial to say that? But, you yeah. know, as a song leader, I, I've been a song leader at Peterborough now probably all for five years, probably. So my term of office may, may be up for renewal soon. Um, <laughs> but to not be afraid, is there somebody else that's not be afraid to say, OK, are we, are we ready for a new voice? Yeah. You know, or can I can I start to give this person a little bit more responsibility and more time um, and work alongside them? So um, a few years ago at Peterborough, we we were all asked as, as leaders to identify somebody who we felt could be the next person um, in, in leadership, you know, and um, and it was acknowledged in, 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 a, in a worship service at the core. And we stood with that, with that, with that other person and we prayed with them. Um, and, and, you know, it's our, our, our desire to grow those people um, into the positions. Otherwise, we are going to lose some of this, this great choral tradition that we've got. And I've seen that in other countries. You know, when Andrew and I go to other countries, they're not as, um, as rich in choral tradition as we are. Mm -hmm. And in, in some places, they, they are losing it a little bit. So, you know, um, we need to keep that going in the UK. Yeah. I think I mean, you, you kind of answered my next question, which was, um, how you how would you approach training young singers and young conductors and young leaders even um, and when I was talking to Harold Bergmeier he said when he first went into his position as the territorial music and creative arts secretary that was his biggest aim of the job to encourage young leaders yeah. and he's, he's he expressed this sense of there were leaders who were very good at what they do but were leaders of the same group for 20 30 40 years and from that generations were missed out and so he he decided actually um he, he had a divisional music school and uh, it was a divisional like a kids camp i think for five weeks all together and he he got 16 young people young adults staff members and over those five weeks each day he gave them tips training um gave them uh, experience to conduct and then when they went back to their core in the september they were set up as young leaders in the course. So they were conducting the sing companies and, and young people's bands and, you know, and, and the younger groups to, just to push them and give them that experience. So I think we share that here in the, in the UK as well, that, that mm -hmm. mentorship idea and, and maybe sure yeah. that we're passing the baton on, but doing it so that we're not just dropping everything and leaving someone to pick it up, but that we're passing it on gradually and training people. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, and this also brings me on, Ron Smart was talking about um, this desire to train um, songster leaders, no matter what age you are, um, but for, for songster leaders to kind of step out of the army bubble and to look for opportunities um, that are there, um, such as conferences and going to see competitions yeah. and whatnot. What, what are your thoughts on that? And, Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I I've been really fortunate that because of my, I suppose because of the school job as well as teacher. And when I when I was a teacher and I was leading music in the school, it was very easy for me to say to my head teacher, "Can I go to the ABC courses, conferences?" You know, and so quite often I'd I'd go to those, which were amazing because they gave you fresh ideas, warm ups, things about vocal health, and th just general things about leading choirs. And there are so many different people there who are leading very small choirs up to large choirs you know and um, I, I think that's interesting the other thing I found interesting is that before we moved to Peterborough um, I took on the village choir um, where we lived so the chorale the Scotland chorale had been going for years and years and years and years and years and I remember them being these old doddery people you know um, and it, it was held um, on a Tuesday evening in the village church and they approached me and asked me if um, I would take on the chorale and they would pay me um, so why not um, so I, I did 
And that was a real learning curve as well, because you learn that not everybody is like a songster brigade in the army and, and actually different choirs run in different ways and even, even different repertoire. I mean, they'd just been singing, you know, um, St. Matthew's Passion and this sort of real highbrow. I mean, I took Jesus himself drew near and they, they thought it was the most amazing thing ever that, that they, they were singing. But that was interesting. It's different personalities and um, just yeah just the, a different way of working with a with a small older choir as well um was fabulous um so just put yourself in different places i think as well but i, I don't think you can become a song leader and then leave it at that mm -hmm. i think you ought to be working at it so you know i mean come on if, if you're on the internet there's so much you can you can google and find out about leading choirs there are facebook groups for for vocal warm-ups there are groups for um you know how to keep choir happy um loads and loads of things and i think it is our responsibility just as it's my responsibility as a head teacher to keep on developing myself I do not know everything about leading a school. Absolutely not. You know, and if I ever do, that's a time to leave. Um, but, you know, I, I need to keep on learning and refreshing. And it's the same, I think, when you're in a leadership, leadership position in the core. And particularly with singing, because you are the sort of the guardian of people's voices. And you have a responsibility to make sure that they are using them in the best way they possibly can. And they might not like it in my songstra brigade when they arrive and we have to do warm ups, first of all. But um, they understand why that's happening. You know, we try and make it fun. We try and warm up and go up to a point, you know, we, we don't sing the biggest song at the end of practice because we need to cool down again. And just understanding those things that a voice needs to warm up. And as you've warmed it up and you've sung on it, you need to cool it down again. I'm not sure that lots of people understand that about, about people's vocal health. Um, and we're working with people who generally don't know how to use their bodies to help them to sing. So we have a responsibility to make sure that, that, that we're doing that. Because lots of, lots of people in songs will quite often come to me and say, um, I can't sing past a C now. Or... I can't sing, you know, I can't sing very quietly anymore. Or if you ask me to sing that, so I can't do that. And, and, it, and, it, and it really will be about the fact that just not been using them correctly, you know. And um, so, so it is our responsibility on us as the leader to make sure that our groups understand those things. Yeah. So we should yeah. be learning. And we, we could talk about this all day, I'm sure. Could just keep bouncing off each other. Um, <laughs> one day we will. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, we'll wrap up now um, and I just want to know if you have any highlights or uh, anything that's stuck in your memory from your career as a you know a Christian musician um, anything that really sticks out to you special and share as, as many as you want I've got to say where, 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 where do I begin where do I begin um, Oh, I mean, I've, I have been extremely privileged and very blessed. Um, uh, and I mean, I, I, I um, shared in songs practice with Birmingham Songsters the other week, and I did share with them the fact that I kind of don't see myself as a as a singer anymore. It's kind of like uh, that was how I used to define myself, and perhaps that's why I can say to singers now, stop and all, all that kind of thing, because I kind of feel like. Um, I, I'll, I'll often say, you know, to the family, I'm not singing anymore, um, because I, I feel like I've had I've had an amazing, privileged time. Opportunities from going with the three sopranos to Canada. Um, we went to the Roy Thompson Hall to their fall festival. Jude Gottrich had got appendicitis. And so they flew the three Sopranos over to um, their fall festival. We were there literally overnight. I mean, we were on our, on our knees. We were tired of the jet lag, but to stand in the wings um, of the Roy Thompson Hall, which I guess would be like the Albert Hall, you know, and to, um, 
<laughs> and just to look out on a congregation of Canadians singing, Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed, was incredible. Um, to sing on the platform of the Albert Hall as a 19-year-old in front of the New York Staff Band and the International Staff Band and Staff Songsters, um, with my new bonnet on that my mum and dad had bought me from SPNS, um, absolutely petrified. But um, I mean, what? I mean, who gets that kind of experience, right? Who 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 gets to do that? Um, to to recordings. Um, I remember recording through it all. I choose to serve the Savior, and everybody left the recording studio. There was myself. There was Len in the box with the producer, um, and we turned the lights out. And I recorded it once. We didn't we didn't record it again. It was kind of a one take wonder, but just. You know, because I, I put everything that I had in, into that. But I think for, for me now, the most special times are things like the TMS girls. Um, I love those girls um, and I love that job. I understand why Susan did it for 21 years or whatever. I, I, I absolutely get that because for me now, the privilege is to be able to pass on the things that I've learned but more importantly, my journey with Christ and helping them to grow in their faith is beyond anything. Um, so when we sang a couple of years ago, we sang the Laura Story song, Blessings. And the girls started just praying over each other. We pray for, they turned and they sang to each other. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace, comfort for families. You know, they sang, they, they prayed that blessing and then we moved out and sang that over the congregation. It was an incredibly, incredibly moving moment. And for me to see some of those girls now growing, getting married, being part of their marriage celebrations and seeing them all getting together, just, I'm, I'm like a mother hen, you know, I, I feel like an old grandma now, but um, I love that. And to see them now working, you know, for the Salvation Army, doing whatever jobs they do, but working in their core, uh, you know, whatever level they're doing, it's, it's, it's incredible. And to be able to touch a life in that way. But one other thing, I remember that um, I went back to Lincoln um, when we'd moved away and um, I was asked to sing at the local Baptist church, which was local to the school that I had taught in. And the school was in a really, really deprived area. Um, it was a tough, tough place. And um, I went back to sing at, at this Baptist church um, with a group of guys who had overcome um, alcoholism and drug uh, abuse. Um, and they shared their testimonies and in that place was a little boy who I had taught he had never set foot in the church before but he'd seen a poster with my name on it and he made his mum go to the church and take and, 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 and take him so that he could see me again and for him to tell me what that had meant to him to be part of that evening and for the mum to talk about what hearing about the impact that Christ had had on people's lives to turn it around just reminded me what it is to be a Christian musician mm -hmm. and what a privilege it is to be able to share the gospel in the way that we do with our voices um, and, and you know with our whole being really um, it, that those things are just real highlights that are incredible moments yeah well thank you so much for sharing um it's been great to chat and um yeah i'll let you get back thank to you. your busy day job now <laughs> back to saving the school and planning a return to school in a global pandemic thank yeah. you <laughs> Bye -bye.